arrive by train, and in a sense that is unfortunate because we miss out on our first lesson about the city of Florence. If we were to arrive in Florence as people did in the old days, that is coming over the hills to look down on Florence, the first thing you'd learn about Florence in the Renaissance and Middle Ages is that Florence was a very small city. The historic center, even to this day, can be traversed in about 30 minutes flat, even with all the traffic. There are few natural resources in the city of Florence. The Arno, of course, is there, but it is both a blessing and a curse. There are no natural defenses for Florence. It is located in a valley. And as the Florentines found out, much to their chagrin in the 16th century, it's hard to defend a city that's down in the valley in the age of artillery. Florence's outlet to the sea along the Arno was habitually blocked by Pisa since the 5th century BC, and Florence was never the capital of a great and expansive empire. It never had an inexhaustible reserve of manpower. It was never the focal point of a great religion like Mecca or Jerusalem or Rome. Yet there was a convergence of political, financial, and artistic talent that was rare in Western history. Florence served as a magnet for writers, for sculptors, for painters, and for goldsmiths. It served as a nursery for bankers and diplomats and ambassadors and soldiers and soldiers of fortune. And it was a laboratory for architects and politicians and scientists and musicians. Whenever something seemed to be happening in the Renaissance, the Florentines were always there and in the middle of it, prompting Pope Boniface VIII to say, the Florentines themselves are together with air, water, earth, and fire, the fifth element of the universe. And the Florentines were never shy about their status. They freely compared themselves to the ancient Romans, to the ancient Greeks. In fact, they dubbed their city the New Athens on the Arno. And like Greece and Rome, the Florentines said they were a great peoples because of their democracy. Now Florence is a city beloved by tourists, but it was at one time scorned by her most illustrious son, and that was Dante, who had engraved on his tombstone the notice that Florence was an unloving mother. If you want to see the greats of Florentine history, the best thing to do is walk along the Uffizi Gallery, and in each of the niches, there is a statue of the 19th century memorializing the great men of Florence in all the different fields. But you will not see a statue of that thing which made Florence prosperous and rich, and to which the Florentines owed everything. And the thing to which the Florentines owed their fortune and fame was the sheep. Now, in this course, we're going to go from Florence's inauspicious beginnings, let's call them, to her height of fame and glory, to her retirement as the city of the arts. And the history of ancient Florence does not begin down on the Arno. It actually begins in the little village up in the hills, the village known as Fiesole.